thank, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, good evening, Kalispiras, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Thanos uh, Kavanis and indeed the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to present uh, here today. I feel a bit uh, under pressure, actually, because uh, it's the first time I've ever heard Maya Biela give a talk, so short a talk, and be on time. And uh, I, feel, I feel I need to follow by example now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I feel under pressure. Okay, uh, this is uh, a slide that uh, Christian Ogo showed uh, earlier in a uh, little more detail, just to highlight uh, the drugs that have been introduced into clinical practice the last 100 years odd. And the reason I show this is because this, this is the second generation drugs, uh, which have been uh, reasonably well successful, uh, but now have uh, lost their patent. And it's this uh, change that has made uh, generic substitution uh, a consideration in the treatment of epilepsy. Now, as I said in uh, a few moments ago, this uh, uh, availability of uh, generics uh, has become very emotional, uh, and it is not only emotional for patients who have access to the literature, but also uh, to prescribers. Uh, but I'm going to show you that the evidence that generic generics are inferior or indeed superior than uh, the uh, uh, penning drugs is, is not the case. The evidence is not there. What we do know about uh, generics is that they have a low cost and that's why they are so attractive. However, for whatever reason, be it uh, seizure, loss of seizure control or exacerbation of seizures or adverse effects, uh, this can result in a very cost, costly outcome. It's been calculated that if a patient with epilepsy uh, attends an A&E uh, admission uh, in the UK, it will cost about 600 pounds, in other words, 1,000 euros. Likewise, if they visit their uh, neurologist uh, uh, for a consultation, uh, we're looking at about 1,000 euros for that uh, visit. And uh, the poor general practitioner at the bottom here, he's the cheapest of all the clinicians that would inv be involved, and it's only 14 pounds, which is about 20 euros, so it's really uh, cost-effective to see your GP in, in the UK. Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, primary um, issues with generics is that uh, familiarity. You can see here uh, the Lamotrigine uh, tablets, uh, and you can see that they have uh, different shapes, different colors, different numbers. Uh, I don't know what 29 or 39 uh, reflects there. Uh, and this is for gabapentin, and you can see they're very uh, different in their, uh, in their look. Also, uh, drug uh, packets look different, and, and patients may become uh, quite confused uh, by all this and actually take the, the wrong medication. Um, and also, a major consideration in regards to generics, which was discussed uh, uh, a little earlier, is the consistency of the formulation supply. So uh, this can be lost or compromised, and therefore there is a continuation of care uh, with regards to particular generic. Now, in the UK, we've got levetiracin, topiramate, and lamotrigine. There's approximately 12 generics for each of these drugs. And what happens in the UK is that if you prescribe a drug by its branded name, i.e. Kepra or Topamax uh, or Lamictal, then the prescription will be filled with that uh, branded drug. But if you write Levetiracetam or Topiramate or, um, or, uh, what's the other one? Uh, or Levetiracetam, uh, then the pharmacist has the uh, power to give you any generic that that the pharmacist uh, uh, wishes. So depending on the day that you go to the pharmacy, he, the pharmacist will, will find the cheapest generic and he will give you that generic. So potentially in the UK, you may go, th you may go through 13 or 14 different generics and this uh, may be a problem, partly because of, as I said, the familiarity of the, of, of the packaging and everything, but also there's a possibility that not all generics are bioequivalent. So I'm going to ask you some questions uh, and uh, humor me and show me your hands if you uh, agree with a particular uh, uh, answer. So my first question is, my experience with generic substitution is that all patients experience problems, i.e. there's an increase in seizures or adverse effects. Some of my patients experience problems. None of my patients experience problems. 
I have no experience with generic substitution. So put your hands up if uh, you are of, you, your answer is all my patients experience problems. Anybody in that category? No. What about some of my patients experience problems? Okay. More of you? Okay. What about none of my patients have problems? Any? One? One, one uh, that's good. And uh, I have no experience with generics. Does anybody? Okay. So there are, there are people that don't have gener uh, generics, particularly in Russia, it appears. Okay. There's no correct answer there. Let me go on to the second question. I do not believe that branty generic substitution is a problem. I believe that branty generic substitution is a problem. So who believes that branty generic substitution is not a problem? A couple of people. Okay, and I take it that the rest of us believe that branch generic substitution is a problem. Is it a problem? Okay, more, more of you. Okay. My third question is: I do not believe that generic to generic substitution is a problem. The previous question was branch to generic. Now the question is generic to generic, or I believe that generic to generic substitution is a problem. So, the uh, the first answer: I do not believe that generic to generic substitution is a problem. How many of you do not believe it? or will choose that statement, none of you. I believe that genetic substitution substitu is a problem. Right, many of you, that's very interesting. So more of you believe that genetic, genetic substitution is more uh, a, a, a critical problem than brand to generic. My next question is, for a generic to be licensed, the following needs to be demonstrated. Bioequivalence is similar to the brand drug. In other words, the bioavailability of the drug, as measured by AUC and CMAX, is the same. The second answer is that, that therapeutic equivalence to the brand drug in terms of efficacy adverse effects is similar. The third answer is both one and two need to be established. And the fourth answer is neither one or two needs to be established. So who uh, would agree with the answer being one? Okay, three of you. What about the answer being two? Nobody. What about the answer being three? Quite a lot of you. And what about the last answer? Who believes that's the correct answer? None of you. Okay. Well, the correct answer is this one. Bioequivalence has to be similar to the brand drug in, in terms of its uh, AUC and CMAX. And I'll be coming back to that. My last question. Bioequivalence is ascertained on the basis of AUC and CMAX values and the 90% confidence interval of the log transform uh, ratio of the AUC and CMAX between the brand and generic products must fall within the range of 80 to 125%. So this is 100% here. So we have 80% there and the other side of, the, of, of this diagram is 125. This is the rule known as the 80-125 rule. So this rule, does it imply to you having read this, that a generic can vary by minus 20% or plus 20% of the brand drug. In other words, we're here, can it go minus 20 or can it go, and can it go plus 25? The second answer is a generic to generic can vary by plus 56 or minus 36. And this is calculated from here. So if you have a generic that's here, to go from here to there, it's plus 56%. To go from there, down to the 80%, it's actually 36%. I've done the calculations. They look odd numbers, but they're actually correct. Okay? And the third answer is both one and two are correct. And the last answer is both one and two are incorrect. So who goes for the first answer? One person. A generic to generic, uh, uh, the answer number two? One person. Okay. Both one and two need to be correct. More of you. And both one and two are incorrect. Still one, I have a resistant person down there. <laughs> okay, well the correct answer is one and two are incorrect. Okay, so this is where the misinformation is. It's not, it's not your fault, it's not my fault. There's a lot of uh, information out there that gives us uh, incorrect information basically. Okay. So, there is a huge amount of uh, misinformation about generics in the literature, and if you look at it, you're, you're, you, might, you may get confused, and rightly so. 
uh, because, of course, the, uh, uh, this misinformation causes uh, anxiety amongst patients uh, and indeed the prescribers, as, as was discussed earlier uh, in the earlier session. Um, different packaging can become very confusing to some patients, particularly the elderly. And patients may be tempted to blame a uh, generic switch from, for an unexpected event, for example, seizure breakthrough or adverse events. And we all know that a single seizure can have a devastating consequence to a patient. And this uh, is, is, is an issue in relation to generic substitution. Generics are not new drugs. Uh, they're different formulations, uh, but contain the same active ingredient uh, and the same amount of drug. Therefore, generics are not required to undergo rigorous efficacy and toxicity testing, like all the new drugs, um, uh, and indeed the branded drug. Instead, what we have, we have a, a, a regulatory um, guideline as to how uh, we should evaluate generics to bring them to market. So, it's a pharmaceutical, uh, it's defined as a pharmaceutical product which is marketed under the international non-priority name and meets the international standardized requirement for essential similarity uh, to the original of this product, which can be a brand or indeed another proprietary drug. So it has the same qualitative and quantitative composition in terms of active substance, pharmaceutical form, the strength of the drug, the route of administration, and also we need to show that the uh, drug has equivalent bioavailability, i.e i.e. it is bioequivalent. So two products are considered bioequivalent if their bioavailability is after administering the same molar dose or similar to such a degree of their effect with respect to the efficacy and safety will be essentially the same. In other words, they are determined to be bioequivalent and by extrapolation we conclude that they're therapeutically equivalent, but we actually don't determine that. So, in essence, two products should display similar pharmacological characteristics in relation to their C max value, which is a measure of rate of absorption, and the area under concentration time curve, which is a measure of the extent of absorption after systemic exposure. And this is just uh, showing you uh, what we're talking about. This is the C max here after drug ingestion, and the AUC is this area under the curve uh, of, of this uh, profile. And the FDA, and indeed the uh, European Medicines Agency, uh, define uh, bioequivalence uh, as the absence of a significant difference in the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety in a pharma in pharmaceutical alternative becomes available at the site of drug action when administered at the same dose, uh, et etc. et cetera. And this is the uh, European Medicines uh, um, Guideline, which is uh, almost identical to that of uh, the FDA. So, what, what is exactly a, a generic? Well, um, it has to be considered to be bioequivalent, as I said, uh, and this is the key here. The key is that the 90% confident intervals of the log transform ratio of the AUC and, and CMAX has to be between 80 and 125%. And this does not mean, as some of us uh, may uh, think, that uh, there is a uh, variability of 45%, which is, you know, 80 to 125, or 125 represents 40, because there's a need to keep the confidence intervals of the analysis within those uh, values. And consequently, typically, what you will see in a generic is a difference of between only 5 to 7 percent. And this is very modest compared to the variability associated uh, for, as a result of inter-individual pharmacokinetic differences and indeed intra-subject plasma drug concentration changes which occur over time, physiological changes, pathological factors, and compliance. Another thing that many of us uh, do, are, are unaware of and is very important is that, uh, at least in the EU, the brand products can vary between lots. So, uh, they are allowed, the pharmaceutical companies are allowed in their production uh, to have uh, bioequivalence bio varying between 95 and 105%. So from batch to batch, if a patient is unlucky to get the two extremes of the batch, there can be potentially a 10% difference in bioavailability. That's between lots. Okay, so this is how it works. We've got the reference product here, and it's assigned 100%. And a new generic comes along, which I'll call A, and the um, AUC and CMAX is, is measured. And there's a difference in bioavailability of this amount here 
But you can see the confidence intervals are within the range between 80 and 120 percent. So it's approved and it becomes available. Then you get a second product coming along. Generate product B. It has the same mean value as the product uh, A, but you can see that the confidence intervals break the, the reference value. So here, it gets rejected. Then we get a third product come along. And of course, we can get a fourth, fifth, sixth, and as we told you earlier, in the UK, we have 14 different um, generics of, of, of some of the major drugs. So a new product comes along. It's product C. Uh, and you can see that its bioavailability is about 15, 18% greater than the re re reference product, but the confidence intervals are within those uh, required. So what happens? <coughs> this, this gets approved. Now, imagine the scenario where we have generic A, which is approved, and we've got generic C that's been approved. Now, these two generics have a substantially greater difference between them than either of them had with the branded drug. And this is where the problem lies. We have the problem of branded generic, which can be significant in some patients, but more significant, as I will show you, is the comparison of different formulations, generics, which be at the extremes of these reference ranges. The other issue with regards to um, uh, generics is the way they are evaluated and allowed to come to uh, market and to clinical practice. So the, oops. so the Food and Drug Administration, indeed the European Medicines Agency, they require the pharmaceutical companies to undertake studies in volunteers, healthy volunteers, not patients. And usually, these healthy volunteers are 25, 30-year-old, very muscular men. <laughs> and these are clearly not representative of, of the average patient. And also, what happens is, it's a single-dose crossover study in approximately uh, two to three dozen uh, patients. That's all they have to do. And this is what happens. They, um, assign uh, the first dose as the branded or the generic drug, and this occurs. And then a week later, they give them the other comparator, and, and this occurs. They measure the Cmax here and the AUC there. And if they are within the guidelines that I mentioned earlier, it gets approved. But in epilepsy, that's not what we have. Because in epilepsy, what happens is we dose patients, so we achieve steady state up here. And therefore, the question is, should we is this AUC here and the Cmax values that are determined up here the same as these single dose uh, values down here? Are they the same? Indeed, can such data be extrapolated to patients, patients taking uh, medication with chronic conditions? Uh, we know that uh, bioavailability may vary depending on various factors, including whether you're a male or a female. Children bioavailability is different, and indeed the elderly, the bioavailability is different because the gastrointestinal tract begins to uh, not work as well. Also, we have food effects. They have profound effects on bioavailability. None of this is tested. And patients with multiple comorbidities, they may have lots of other drugs take, taken on board, and what happens to the bioavailability uh, in this setting? Well, what is the evidence that generic substitution results in clinically important uh, consequences? Well, I should tell you straight away, there are no randomized controlled trials, unless the one earlier that was described was. I wasn't in the audience when, when, it, when it was described. However, what we do have is a literature that's populated with cases. Um, and uh, as a result of this, we've got population bias. If you have uh, all your patients doing well by being substituted and you submit your paper to Epilepsia, where I'm an associate editor, uh, it will be turned down because it's, it's, it's fine. We don't need to know about all these successful uh, um, conversions. What really alerted us to this issue 
uh, was uh, the study of uh, Andaman, Fra um, Fred Andaman uh, from Canada. And what he reported uh, with his colleagues in 2007 was the switchback rates from generics to branded drugs. So what happened was uh, they switched uh, patients to, uh, branded, uh, to generic drugs and if they complained, if they weren't feeling well, if they had seizure breakthrough or adverse effects, they switched them back. And what they did, they compared lamotrigine, clobazam, and valparate with simvastatin and, and various antidepressants. And you can see the switchback rates for uh, these drugs was substantial, 13%, 21% for the other drugs, compared to a, up to about 3% for the other comparators. What was interesting is in those patients that persisted, and they were, uh, their, their doses, uh, they, they persevered and they, 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 whatever problems they had, they overcome. If you looked at the doses, the doses before uh, these patients were, were, were uh, switched over uh, was lower than after, suggesting in this uh, study that perhaps the Lamotrigine uh, generic was not as bioequivalent, suggesting. A similar study was, oops. A similar study was reported by, by, by uh, sorry, a similar study was uh, reported by uh, the Loria uh, in uh, a subsequent year, exactly uh, the same kind of take-home message which I won't go into. And the other thing that has been uh, looked at is the risk and cost associated with generic substitution uh, by Zachary and his colleagues, mm -hmm. and where they found an association between receive, patients receiving epilepsy care in an emergency or inpatient setting, and the recent occurrence of an AD formulation switch. So if they had made a generic formulation switch within the previous six months, they were 81% more likely to present to an a and &E, uh, service. And I think the very telling uh, publication is this one by De and, and colleagues in, uh, the, uh, in 2009, uh, where they looked at topiramate, and the risk of head injuries or fracture was shown to be three times greater following a generic to generic switch compared to the brand use. So generic, generics perhaps may not be so interchangeable. And, th and this is the answer that a lot of you gave, that you were more concerned about generic to generic. Well, these are the data to show you that perhaps we should be concerned about such uh, substitution, particularly if you are unlucky enough to substitute the two extremes of the generics, although they are bioequivalent as a result of the, in, of the um, uh, regulatory authorities. Now, <coughs> epilepsy is a source of spontaneous fluctuating symptoms. Not all changes in seizure frequency are necessarily drug related, and we know that there are some minority of patients who are particularly sensitive to dose. We see that all the time. But many patients respond to a modest dose of a drug, uh, at whatever uh, anti drug is, is, is prescribed. So they're relatively insensitive to a dose. And even those patients who are uncontrolled tolerate frequent doses uh, adjustment and change in, in drug levels. And also, we have mixed messages in the literature. You know, we're told that perhaps, you know, this 10, 15% changes in bioequivalence is clinically uh, relevant. And maybe it is. And maybe it is in a particular minority of patients. But look at this. This is from the SPC of Lamictal in the UK. Uh, and they... Uh, found this interaction, we know about this olanzapine interaction uh, having an effect on lamotrigine, and they put in the SPC, so for all of us to read, uh, that a 50 milligram of olanzapine reduced their use in CMAX of lamotrigine by an average of 24 to 20% respectively, an effect of this magnitude is not generally expected to be clinically relevant. Well, if it's not clinically relevant, why does, uh, does GlaxoSmithKline then go out and say you should keep to our Lamictar because if you switch over to a generic, which potentially may be 10, 15% difference, uh, it will be very important. I hope there isn't any Smith kind person in the audience. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and just to uh, further emphasize uh, the, the, these issues is uh, the elderly. I mean, the elderly are particularly uh, susceptible to uh, uh, dose changes and blood level changes uh, because their metabolic and renal functions uh, decline with, with, with age. And of course, changes in bioavailability uh, are less readily uh, coped by, uh, by, by, by the elderly. Indeed, they're more sensitive to drug related adverse effects, so lower concentrations will result in higher uh, incidence of adverse effects. And um, 
and these effects may result in uh, settings where uh, they uh, may result in greater morbidity. So uh, the regulatory or the, uh, uh, there are guidelines out uh, on generic substitu substitution, but they're really very, very way, vague. Um, and this is uh, from the uh, NICE guidelines in the UK. And uh, basically they're saying to us, there's probably a difference in bioavailability, uh, uh, but I recommend that you go and see the SBC and the BNF, but there's nothing there to tell you what's going on but there is perhaps you know, a problem. So they basically wash their hands of it. There's nothing uh, very helpful there. Oops. And uh, this is the uh, position statement by the American Academy of Neurology. Similarly, uh, be, be uh, cautious, but we don't really know uh, whether or not it is important. So really, a lot of this data that has been uh, uh, produced, uh, has been published in the literature, uh, although the uh, patients that have uh, had problems uh, are, 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 are real problems. What nobody has shown is that these problems are associated with an inequivalence of the drug. Nobody's actually measured the, uh, the, the bioavailability of these different drugs or even do a blood concentration measurement when patients present uh, with uh, adverse effects or breakthrough seizures after a substitution. Nobody has shown it. So all of this data, although some of it more convincing than others, is, is good, we don't, have the right, we don't have an answer. So in conclusion, in most cases, and certainly for the new antidrugs, uh, the generics are, are attractive because they are cheaper. We should remember that generics are not inferior to the branded drugs because they're exactly the same uh, active uh, ingredients. Uh, generic prescribing may be fine in newly diagnosed patients, so patient presents to clinic for the first time di diagnosed uh, with uh, epilepsy, it's fine to, to prescribe a generic levotiracetam or generic to pyramate, etc., etc. Generic substitution can be justified in uncontrolled epilepsy. That is not a problem. Uh, generic switching is not advisable in seizure-free patients because if indeed there is a in, uh, if, if the bioavailability is not the same, the patient will have a, a seizure or two, and of course that will impact uh, on his or her lifestyle. Oops. Switching uh, between generics from different manufacturers should be avoided. And we have some uh, secondary data showing that, and it's the feeling of most of you here that that is a particular uh, problematic uh, consideration. And lastly, it's very important that we realize that it's very, very difficult to have consistency of supply of generic anti drugs because they, they all come onto the market and they want to get a market share of it. And if they don't do very well, they won't hesitate to withdraw their drug because they're there to make money. So if you have a patient of a particular generic and it's no longer available, then you're stuck. Um, so con consistency and continuity of supply is, is very important. And lastly and not least, if you are planning to substitute a generic for a branded drug, it's, it's very simple to do some blood level monitoring. Just see what the levels are before the, the, the switch and then after. And if the patient is complaining and the values are the same, then you know it's not drug related. Conversely, if they're, if they're very different, then you know that it's, it's a drug related effect. And this is just fundamental uh, information that none of us have. So with that, uh, I thank you all for your attention.